We're going to pick up with verse 6. And as we have been doing, uh, we're just going to read the text before we're going to finish up chapter 3 and, Lord willing, get a head start into chapter uh, 4. Uh, but if you'll begin with me, well, let's start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. David. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, in our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake? Before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, that you should receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarn you and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. There was a head of a very ancient monastery that was in charge of copying uh, all the old canons and, and laws of the church. But he became disgruntled when he observed how the, haphazardly some of the younger monks were copying these ancient texts. And they just weren't, weren't paying attention to detail. And he became concerned for this, with this, so he, he went down into the cellar uh, with one of the copies to check it against the original. Hours later, they heard this great sobbing coming from the cellar, and the old monk was crying over and over, an R. They left out the R. They've misspelled it. Well, one of the monks went downstairs to check it out and see what's wrong, and the old guy was saying, the word is celebrate. Celebrate, I tell you, not celibate. Uh, of course, we're going to see in our study this morning uh, that this call for celibacy is for those who are the unmarried. Um, attending a marriage, a wedding for the first time, this little girl looked over at her mother and she asked, Mommy, why is the bride dressed in white? Well, thinking that an explanation of uh, the symbol of purity was probably a little too far advanced for the little girl, she said, because white is the color of happiness. And this is the happiest day of her life. The little girl thought about that for a moment, and then she said, well, why is the groom dressed in black? <laughs> Just a heads up, we're going to be doing uh, quite a few word studies this morning. Uh, please don't let it be intimidating. I know some of you kind of dig that sort of thing. Some of you immediately shut down as soon as the first uh, Greek word comes up on the screen. Uh, but uh, I, I feel it's going to be very important for our context this morning. So uh, uh, just kind of ride along with us if you can. Let's go ahead and begin verse 6. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in our infliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. You know, it's as though when we read these letters of Paul that he shares with the, the many churches that he had been involved in throughout the entire Roman Empire, uh, as we read these letters, we see that there is a, he found his life in the well-being of others. Uh, he didn't find his life in the well-being of himself. 
Uh, he, he didn't find it in creature comforts. And, and the latest thing that was uh, out there, the latest clothes or the most uh, hippest technology or anything like that, he found his life. I mean, his well-being was found in the, knowing that others were doing well in their walks with Christ. And we learned from that there's this in, immutable fact, I think, that we have uh, concerning being in the body of Christ. This teaches us something that we cannot escape. And that is that we need each other. You know, we don't need each other just simply because some people in the body of Christ are affirming and, and encouraging and, and uh, always have a good thing to say. Uh, and we get along well with them. We don't need the body of Christ just so we can get our props. We need the body of Christ because that's how God works within us. is through his body. And we, we, we do truly need each other. For what thanks, he says in verse 9, can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God. Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now he'd only been with them for less than a month. Um, less Three Sabbaths is what we learn in the book of uh, Acts. Uh, so somewhat short of four weeks. That's how much time he'd spent with the um, Thessalonians. Thessalonians. And yet he, when he speaks of them, he, uses, he says, we pray for you day and night exceedingly. And this word exceedingly in the original language, it's huperet parasu. Uh, and it's one of those words that just got a whole bunch of words glommed together, just kind of smooshed together. The first part of it, huper, uh, means over. And we use that as an English uh, prefix. A lot of medical terms will have hypertension, hypoglycemia. Uh, hyperthyroidism you know it means uh, it's you whatever the organ is talking about is producing too much it's over uh, and then the second part of it is the word ek which means out our word exit comes from it and then the third part of it third part of the word is the, the word parisos which means over and above and he's used all three of these words kind of smushed into one to make his point it's the same word that he uses when he's writing to the ephesians in chapter 3 verse 20 where he says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all uh, that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. George Finley, Greek uh, professor from a turn of the century uh, guy, pretty well known in the original language. And, and he, he, this is what he called a triple Pauline uh, intensive. Uh, you know, Greek is kind of like uh, German where you take a lot of words and moving them together to make the word more intensive uh, and sometimes if Paul really wants to underscore and bold face and highlight a word he'll do this and that's that's the word that he uses here when he he says that we pray uh, day and night exceedingly that we will someday be able to see your face once again the word perfect that he uses here it's the word uh, Cartizo, catarizo, and it's a means to, it's a word that would be used to refer to mending the nets. When Jesus saw the disciples mending their nets, that's the word that they use. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean it's made perfect, but something was lacking, and, and, and as a result of that perfection, what was lacking was filled in. Uh, there was a hole in the net, and they filled in the hole. Uh, it'd be used for setting broken bones. No, the, what wasn't right, the bone was broken, so what was lacking was fixed. Uh, ketratizo. Um, it's the word that he uses in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 where he's talking about the gift that God gives to the church, this, the, this gift of men, where he says, and he gave some to be apostles and some to be uh, prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. And then he says in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And this word equipping is that word ketratizo. Uh, and he says, I, I, I want to give, uh, I, I pray exceedingly day and night so that what would be lacking in your faith could be made full, could be made complete, could be made perfect uh, if we could see each other uh, once again. And now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. You know, we saw in chapter 2 where it says, I have wanted to come to you time and time again, but Satan hindered me. Remember when we studied that a couple of weeks ago? And, and now he's saying here, he says, May God direct me in my way to you. Wherever Satan hinders, if we keep our eyes on God, God will provide a way. Uh, 
You know, we don't have to worry about Satan hinders because God allowed that hindering. He's working something out in that process. We just keep our eyes on him. We keep being obedient to him and his word. And then he'll f- figure it all out in the end. And so he, he makes his prayer that God would direct his way to the Thessalonians. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do uh, to you. This word abound, it comes, it's actually the verb form of uh, a part of that word that we saw earlier. It's the parasuo. Uh, the NIV uses the word, this one that means over and above. New International uses the word overflow to describe it here. Uh, that may God make our love overflow into you. You know, for me as a pastor, and specifically as a pastor of Calvary Chapel of Oklahoma City, I am blown away, continually blown away, by the outworking of love that I see here within the church. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean the, you know, the Sunday morning hug and a smile and say, oh, you look great, how's the family kind of courteous sort of love. I don't mean that. That's good. That's fine. But uh, that's not what Paul's talking about, and it's certainly not what I observe when I see what's going on at Calvary Chapel. Uh, it's more of the down in the trenches, work through all the hard stuff and, and uh, accept each other fully because Jesus accepts us fully kind of love. And I'm blown away as I see this being fleshed out before me between the lives of the people that are part of this uh, fellowship. And as great as it is and as... B- awesome as I, how, as blessed as I am when I observe this, we still got a lot of work to do, don't we? Uh, there, I mean, there, there's always room for improvement in, in this. There's so much work to do in this area. And so Paul says, uh, may you not only accomplish that, but I pray that you would increase in it. And that you would not only increase in it, but that you would abound in it. That you would, as the NIV says, that you would overflow in it. That there would be no containing this kind of selfless love. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now the word saints here is the, it's the plural word here and it's the word hagioi. And literally the NIV says holy ones. And that's a very accurate translation but that can be a little misleading. Uh, because when you say somebody's a holy one, you think that's somebody who sticks their hands inside their sleeves and they always have a sour look on their face and, and they never smile and, and they're, they're holy. You know, they, they look like they've been sucking on persimmons all day long. And, and that's what we think of as a holy person. Uh, and, and so it, even though that's literal, it is a little misleading. Uh, the word holy, uh, by the way, this word, the term here, I believe there's some... Uh, Uh, commentators that would differ, but I believe that the word here, when it occurs in the New Testament, hagioia in the plural, hagios in the singular, is used exclusively of New Testament believers. It's not talking about angels. It's not talking about really good people. It's not talking about people that died and got canonized. It's talking about New Testament believers, people who are living in the New Testament age and have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about holiness... We're not talking about actions so much as attitudes that produce the actions. And and he says that uh, he he wants, he prays that God would establish their hearts blameless in holiness. Not talking about sinless perfection, not that at all. But uh, that he would get us established that when we do sin, we deal with that sin properly. We would deal with that sin in accordance with the Bible. You know, we we would confess it and forsake it and turn from it and then move on. Now, Paul closes the first of uh, the, the, or the first three chapters. He closes all three of these uh, with a statement regarding the Lord's soon return. Uh, you know, he didn't break it up into chapter divisions, but the guys that did, I think, noticed this, and they close each chapter uh, with Paul's statement uh, somewhat uh, having to do with the Lord's return. In chapter 1, the closing verses of chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And now to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? 
You are our glo- glory and joy. And, and this closing phrase here that we just looked at in chapter 3 is going to be an introduction to actually what Paul's theme of his two epistles are, the return of Christ. And he's going to, he's, all of his preliminary statements have been leading up to this. And, and he says, uh, as we're talking about the, the rapture of the church and the Lord's return, uh, before I do, Paul says, let me talk about one thing necessary. Let me talk about one thing that we need to deal with before we get into the issue of the timing of the Lord's return. He wants to address a crucial element of preparation for that soon coming day. And so he starts off chapter 4 with finally, then brethren. You know, this, is, this doesn't mean it's time to close your Bible and zip up the, the cover. Okay, just because the preacher says finally. Uh, this means, okay, everything I've said so far, here's what it means. Here's how we apply it. And he says, finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. What should they abound more and more in? Well, how they ought to walk and please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. You know, pleasing God is the key to the Christian walk, the Christian life. You know, why, why are we here? What is our purpose here on earth? Well, it's to please God. You know, that's why he put us here. It's for his enjoyment, for his pleasure. We are here for his pleasure. And our walk is to be one that is pleasing to him. The word walk here, he says, uh, where he, he says that you should, uh, um, ought, uh, how you ought to walk and to please God. It, the word walk is the word parapateo. Now, the word pateo means walk. That's the word for walk. But he has the prefix in front of it, peri, like perimeter, which means around. And parapateo means to walk around. Uh, It's not just kind of a bebop and sashay and kind of just casual, not thinking about where your steps are going sort of thing, but it's to walk circumspectly. You're walking around the matter. You're looking at it from all angles. How do we walk the Christian walk? Well, we look at it from over here. We look at it from over here. We look at it from over here. Uh, And that's what Paul is saying, that, that we should know how we ought to walk circumspectly. Uh, the word ought is one word in the Greek language, one three-letter word, day, and it's a full sentence. Uh, it means it is necessary. Uh, that three, those three letters could actually stand alone as a complete sentence in Greek. It means that which is necessary. In the old King James, oftentimes you'll see the word meat. Jesus said it is, it is not meat. He told the woman it is not meat that the uh, bread should go to uh, the dogs. You know, the bread's for the children, not for the dogs. Uh, when he was making that uh, illustration to the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, it, it means it is necessary. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So what is this circumspective walk? What is this, this uh, uh, thing that is necessary for us to do to have a walk that's pleasing to God? What is the will of God? I mean, every Christian, that should be the first question they ask. God, what do you want from me? What do you want for me? What is your will? And he tells us right here, he says, this is your will. Or this is his will for you, your sanctification. The word sanctification, it's the word hagiosmos. And uh, our word holy, holiness and and so forth, comes to us uh, actually through the Germanic language. You know, English is based upon uh, Ger- Ger- Germanic uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, roots, and it comes to us through that. The word sanctification, saintly, uh, saints, all of that comes through the Latin of the same thing. And so sanctify and holify are synonymous terms. Uh, holiness and sanctification are the same thing. What is holiness? Well, it means to be set apart for a purpose. You know, sometimes we call this the sanctuary, which means the holy place. That's what the word literally means. Um, Why does it mean that? Is this place any holier than the foyer? Uh, the, The idea of that meaning is that this is the place where we come to meet God. I'm not real hip on that terminology myself. I, don't, I, I would just as soon call this room the auditorium because I don't think there's any place that we go to meet God that's any better than any other place. That we go. I think the foyer can be just as much of a sanctuary as the auditorium can be. I think the streets can be a pretty good sanctuary. 
Uh, but that's, that's why we call this, because th- this room is set apart for that purpose. Uh, you know, I've got a mug, an insulated mug at home. It's a holy mug. Uh, it's holy mug. It's a, it's, it's a very holy mug because it, it has been set apart for the purpose of iced tea. That's the only thing you put in it, iced tea. It's the only thing I've ever put in it. I don't put coffee in it because I don't want the coffee to affect the taste of the mug. I wouldn't want to put water in it because it's got a tea taste to it. It's a holy mug. It's been set apart for a specific purpose. Now, if you would put it next to your mug that you might put coffee in, they might look the same. There's nothing different in the DNA of them. The cellular makeup's the same. The difference is what they're used for. And that's what the word holy means, set apart for a use. You know, we live in America. It's a republic for the people, by the people, and of the people. Uh, And... um, you know, there is in Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue, there's a house. It's a big white house. And it's sometimes called the people's house. You know what that means? I'm a people. That means it's my house. Right? It's my house. That 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, that's my house. Now, I don't think I'd get very far if I were to go in there and think I could just walk into the living room one of 20 or whatever, I could walk in the living room and kick off my shoes, prop them up on the the coffee table and look around for the clicker. You know, I probably wouldn't get very far that way. Why? Because it's been set up. You know, the White House is holy. Now, some people would take issue with that. I understand, you know, uh, but it's got nothing to do with the quality or the spirituality of the inhabitants. Uh, That's not what makes it holy. It's holy because it's been set apart for a specific purpose. It's to house the presidents and their family. Uh, That's its purpose. And so when he says that this is the will of God for us, our holiness or our sanctification, what that means is that we don't suck persimmons and walk around with a sour look on our face and doesn't mean that we have to get dead and then voted on uh, to see if we qualify. It just means that as Christians, as believers in Jesus, we have been set apart for a purpose. Well, what is that purpose? God's pleasure. Uh, we've been set apart for God's pleasure. And then, but then, notice in my New King James, at the, the, in verse 3 here, it says, For this is the will of God, uh, your sanctification, colon. And so he's going to qualify it a little further as he goes into the next clause, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Um, now, my New King James translates the word sexual immorality. Your Bible might use the word fornication. There's different ways. That what it means is any kind of illicit sex. All kinds of illicit sex. Anything that could fall under the category of being illicit falls under the category of porneia. Our word pornography comes from that, but the word porneia is not limited to pornography. Pornography would be contained in that, obviously. Uh, but it's much broader than that. Pornography is only one facet of porneia. And he doesn't use the word moikeo, which is the word, it's a very technical word for, for adultery. They're two entirely different words. He doesn't use that word here. He uses a much broader term uh, of porneia. Anybody that commits moikeo, or uh, mor- morkeo, is guilty of porneia, but not everybody that c- commits porneia is guilty of makeo, because moikeo is only when a married person has sexual activity with somebody they're not married to. That's adultery. But he doesn't use that word. He's talking about any kind of of out-of-wedlock sexual behavior. Now, I know someone could say, come on, Mary, you get hip. This is the 21st century. I mean, come on, that's very outdated, outmoded. That is so last century. That is so, that's your parents' mores. Uh, That's so yesterday. I would admit that it was my parents' mores. Uh, and I will also confess that a lot of today's mores are the result of what my generation did with it. I confess that very openly. We've seen a very clear and unmistakable erosion of sexual purity in the last few decades. I can remember complaining about 10 years ago, how you could not turn on a primetime television program and not watch a single episode of anything, a drama, a comedy, whatever, and there not be 
references to illicit sexual activity, uh, whether it be a reference or some sort of a, uh, uh, enactment. Today, you can't view a primetime television show without there being some sort of reference to homosexual activity. Uh, and, and that's something that we've seen happen just in the last 10 years. Uh, back in 1985, they established in, in New York City the Harvey Milk High School, named after the famous homosexual uh, activist. And it's not exclusively, but it's a school that is it's a, a transfer school, high school, that caters to gay, lesbian, and transsexuals. High school. You know, to give them, give people, the, the teenage kids that have uh, a, a, that orientation a place where they'll feel safe and comfortable. When I was a kid, we didn't have a skinny, ugly kid school, you know, <laughs> some place for me to feel comfortable in. Uh, we just, I just went to school. Uh, but th- this has all changed so much in our lifetime. You know, I was researching this this week, and there's only five states in the United States that in their, their statutory law, the state's law, there's only five states that even allow for the teaching of abstinence in the high school sex education programs. Uh, and it's not even set mandated that they do. It just says that they can. And it, there's only five states. It's Washington, uh, Rhode Island, California, Hawaii, and Illinois, of all places. Only five states where that, according to their state law, they can teach that a- as an alternative. How does this happen in such a short period of time? <clears throat> well, it only takes about 10 minutes for a pot of water at room temperature to come to the boiling point. And we have become that proverbial frog in the proverbial pot of water. Um, and the result is that, that many, I, 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 I mean, I think far too many in the church have even uh, adopted some sort of cavalier attitude towards sex. Now, the 21st century doesn't have a corner on the market for promiscuity. Um, it's, we can look at past cultures and see that uh, they, they knew how to sin, okay? Um, Roman culture, the culture that Paul was writing to, to the Thessalonians, was completely debased. Uh, I mean, it was, remember, they were, they were Greeks in Thessalonica. This was part of Greeks. Uh, they were steeped in paganism. And when Paul established the church there, the, all of these guys that became part of the church, they had come out of this very heavily influenced Greek idolatry. And in, in their churches, in the Greek idol system, uh, they even had temple prostitutes. I mean, they would go, a guy would go to church, and the way he would worship his God would be making a donation. In the, they, he'd put some money in the gopi box and then have sex with one of the priestesses. Now, if I was going to invent a religion, I would probably want to do something like that too because that, that caters to the, this baseness that is in our natural man. I mean, you know, if you're going to invent a religion, why don't you throw something like that in the equation, right? But as somewhat of a student of, of history, I love history, and I, and I wouldn't call myself uh, a, a, a history, history scholar, but I'm definitely a student of it. And, and this kind of debauchery, this kind of tubing morally has always been a telltale sign of the deterioration of a society. Read Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, for example. We can just look in the book of Genesis at the Sodom and Gomorrah and see how this was. Um, you know, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah was hip. You know, when, when uh, Lot came into Sodom and Gomorrah and tried to preach, uh, he, 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 the New Testament tells us about that righteous Lot that, would, that was in there trying to preach to them to turn away from their ways. And they were saying, come on, Lot, get hip. This is the 21st century, B.C. You know, we, we, can, we, can, we, we, we don't have all of those kind of taboos that your mother and father had. Um, and here's something that we need to understand. We need to grab a hold of very clearly and, and grab onto this. Paul is not saying that sex is bad. Sex is not bad. I've been married almost 43 years. Sex is good. In fact, it's real good. I mean, I I don't want you to misunderstand me here, but it, it it is so good. It's holy. You know what I mean? 
It's, it's set apart for a specific thing, for a specific place, for a specific purpose. Now, one of the reasons, I don't know if you have heard about this or not, but there's several reasons why we can see the decay in our society. Uh, we wouldn't even have time to go into them all this morning. But one of the reasons is this little hormone that's produced in, by our pituitary glands. Men and women both have it, and it's known as oxytocin. And during times of attachments, when we, when we have emotional attachments, this hormone is redu- re- released. When a mother gives birth, the first time she begins nursing this baby, there's a rush of this oxytocin that flows through her system. And it makes an attachment, a bond between mother and child. And men have it as well. In fact, they did a study several years ago with a, a group of single men and a group of married men. And they gave the married men this nasal spray of oxytocin and uh, they noticed that to a, a large degree, when they would take these two groups of men and put them in a mixed uh, couple setting, the married men tended to stand further away from the attractive women because they had received this dose of oxytocin. Because, see, they're already bonded. They're already attracted. They've already made this thing with, with, uh, with their spouses. And so they avoided that attraction uh, from, from a pretty girl. The single guys... They had no such compulsions because they hadn't received uh, this amount of the hormone. And this, this oxytocin, it's reduced, uh, uh, produced by the uh, pituitary gland, released during times of, of uh, major bonding relationships. For example, mother and, and her child or uh, boy-girl love interests. And the, the problem with it, they've noticed that when that attachment has been made... And then the attachment is broken. As in the case, you take a mother and a child, and the attachment's been made at a young age, but then if the mother becomes abusive older, uh, later on, and that relationship is strained, it makes it harder for that child to grow up and make relationships in the future. If you have a, a boy and a girl, teenage boy and a girl, and they come together and they have a, a great influx of this oxytocin and they become bonded together and then something happens and they become uh, pulled apart, it, it's harder for them to bond later on. And, and so if, if somebody has a ca- cavalier sort of attitude toward this sort of thing, uh, you know, God gave us oxytocin in order to make our bonds tighter and more insoluble. But if that becomes broken, then... We don't treat that relationship the way God intended us to treat it. And then our morals slip as a result. And so those that have had multiple serious relationships find it easier to break away during some sort of time of stress. This is one of the reasons, and this is just something to keep in mind, uh, statistically, people that have been divorced and remarried are more likely to get divorced again than those that have never been divorced. And I think it's because of this bonding hormone, oxytocin, called the love hormone, or the cuddle hormone, or the bonding hormone. I, I believe this is what Solomon had in mind in the Song of Solomon where he writes in chapter 8, verse 4 of his song, This is from the NLT, but he says, Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, do not awaken love until the time is right. This is something that God gave us to be preserved for the husband and wife bonding, for the husband and wife coming together. That that my oxytocins and Sherry's oxytocins can glom onto each other. And that we would be that way for the rest of our uh, union together. See, God has a very beautiful plan for this, our sanctification. He's got a very beautiful way for this to happen. Satan's perverted it. Satan's turned it upside down. Satan's tried to make it an issue of, of uh, being old Victorian past days sort of thing. He's tried to make it an issue of being hip versus being prudish. He's tried to make it an uh, issue of anything other than what it is, a matter of holiness. But the writer of the Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 4, marriage is honorable among all, 
and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. The word marriage here is the word gamos. And it comes from a very ancient Greek root, a very old Greek root that means to bind or to unite, to join together. Then he says in verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. The New International Version, NIV, says this way. says that each of you should learn to control his own body. And if you got the NIV this morning, you'll notice uh, a footnote. There's a little, some sort of a notation to it. And in the footnote it says, uh, an alternate rendering of this is, or to learn to live with his own wife, or to learn to acquire a wife. Now, I admit it's a good thing for husbands to want to know how to learn to live with their wives. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm down with that. And it's probably not a bad di- thing for a guy to learn how to get a good wife. That's not a bad thing either. I would agree with those two sentiments. I just wouldn't agree with those two as being a translation of this verse. That's, that's not, I think, what Paul is trying to say here. Um, that each of you should learn to uh, control his own body. I think that is what... Paul is trying to say. Um, now, the word vessel in my New King James, where it says that each of you should know how to possess his vessel, it's possible. The word is just vessel. And so it's possible he may be talking about talking to me about possessing my vessel, my body, but it could be that he's talking to me about me possessing my vessel, Sherry's body, that I would know how to best deal with her, that I would know how to best minister to her needs in this marriage union. Uh, that because it's not about my body, it's about her body from my perspective. And it could be that he's saying something like that. Or even, even if, if a boy just starts dating a girl, uh, that he would realize that he needs to possess, be concerned with her vessel, wanting to tr- deal, treat it right rather than trying to uh, get his own. That we would all know how to possess our own body in sanctification, in holiness, and honor, not in passion of lust, just like the Gentiles who do not know God. Passion of lust. If you got the old King James today, it's the word concupiscence, isn't it? When was the last time you used that in a sentence? It's not really that archaic of a word. It's just that our language has kind of been dumbed down a lot. But uh, it, it, just, it means what, what, what the word concupiscence means is passion of lust, is what it means. In fact, the Greek word is the word epithemia, uh, which literally means to burn upon. Um, not just in this unrestrained burning like we see in the Gentiles who don't know God. That's what Paul says. The, the Gentiles don't know God. They don't know any better. They don't know how to walk in a way that's pleasing to Him. We can't expect them to. They don't know how. They don't know God. We do. And we do know how. The language hasn't changed. Or the language has changed, I guess we could say. But the Word of God hasn't. So, let me see if I get this right. God put these hormones inside of me. Not only these oxytocins, but these testosterones and these estrogens and and all of these different boy girl kind of things that he puts inside of all boys and girls and then he says don't act on them is is that what it is is that what uh, we take from this Um, well God puts in us a desire to worship too that's something that's part of our actual creation is that we have this capacity to worship we are worshiping beings does that mean we can just go worship however whomever and wherever whatever who well, no. he put that desire to worship in us so that we would worship him not a lamppost and he put these hormones inside of us so that we would learn how to control our own vessels in a way that would bring him glory and honor that we could walk in a way that's pleasing to him uh, philippians or i'm sorry proverbs chapter 6 verse 27 says can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned Does this mean that fire is bad? No. Uh, now, an out-of-control wildfire, uh, this is a picture of the fires from last week in, in Los Angeles. 
You take an out-of-control wildfire, poof, that's bad. That's deadly. That's fearsome. But then there's nothing more endorsing producing than a warm hearth on a cold night. Fire is good. In fact, it's unsurpassed when it's used properly. But it's fatal when it's not. He, he says this to us. He says that uh, we should not act as the Gentiles do. The, one, the guys out there that don't know God. Don't act like they do. But that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother. And if you want to take your pencil and write and sister in there as well. That's what he means. No one should take advantage of and defraud his brother or sister in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also warned you and testified. So, you know, that's kind of sobering. The people that have this kind of a, a, a cavalier attitude to premarital sexual activity, anything that's outside of the marriage bedroom, anything that's outside of the uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 kind of relationship, uh, God says, I'll take vengeance. Uh, this is something that I think is a very important issue. This is something, uh, you know, in F Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2, and he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's because this marriage union that God creates at, 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 at a wedding is representative of the union that Christ has with his bride. The sexual activity doesn't pick, doesn't, uh, uh, is not that, but it does picture that. And sexual activity outside of marriage pictures idolatry. Sexual activity within marriage pictures that Ephesians 5 union. So he says, God's an avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. And then he says in verse 7, For God did not call us to uncleanness but the holiness. Uncleanness here is the word akarthesia. Um, it means all impurity. I think we're about down to our last Greek word here. It means all impurity. You know, boys will say, I love you to a girl in order to get sex. Girls will give sex in order to hear boys say, I love you. And, and Paul says, no, we should look out for, uh, for to, where he says, that don't defraud our brother or our sister in the matter. Um, think of that boy or that girl that we're about to get into a relationship uh, with. As You know, sometimes you've heard it said that uh, tell, tell guys when you go out on a date, just think of that, that, uh, that girl as, as somebody's daughter, you know, or, or your sister. And what would you do if somebody treated your sister like that? Forget that. That girl is God's daughter. You're, you're taking out God's daughter. Or God's son, as the case may be. And just remember that God takes this matter pretty heavily. See, we tend to think of it, I think, like this. We, the, 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 when the world thinks of this whole spectrum of things that we would call uh, sexual activity, it's like on a calibrated scale. You know, we got marriage, uh, bed, and then you move down the scale a little bit and you get to the illicit sex, the sex outside of marriage. And, and then the, the adultery part uh, that's a little further over on the scale. And then over here, we've got the uh, homosexuality that's even further down the scale. But the way we calibrate it is, okay, sex is within marriage is okay. Uh, everything in the middle is kind of so-so. And even the far end of the uh, spectrum today is considered acceptable. That's the typical worldview today that is rapidly, rapidly becoming the church's view as, as well. But the reality is God doesn't calibrate it like this. God has the marriage bed on one end and then everything else is at the other extreme. Uh, he's got the marriage bed on one end and everything else, he's what he says here in verse uh, 7, unclean. And the marriage bed is holy. Therefore, he says in verse 8, he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> I would be first 
to acknowledge that I may not be the best presenter on a subject like this. I just know me. You know, some might think I'm too blunt. Others might think I'm too indelicate. Others might think, you know, you didn't hit it hard enough. I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. And I'll, I'll own any criticism of me. But we can't criticize the subject. You know, I mean, if, if somebody takes issue with what the Bible says on this, then you get mad at me all you want to, but you're mad at the, you're, you're shooting the messenger. Uh, you know, you can't be mad at me for the subject itself because these aren't my words, they're the Lord's. And if we reject this, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the Lord. That's what he says. Let's pray. God, we do want to pray for your church, your chaste bride. Uh, Lord, we live in a day and age when there are so many assaults coming from so many different ass- angles and uh, being pressed down on every side. And, and one of the greatest battles that we fight right now is this one of purity. And so, Lord, get it established. Just stick it way down deep inside our hearts, what your heart in this is, and that we might strive increasingly more and more to walk in a well that's well ple- a way that's well pleasing to you. God, you've called us to holiness. We've been set apart for your use. We're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. What a glorious price that is and what a glorious thing you have in store for us when we walk in a way that's pleasing to you. So teach us that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The stand. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're going to have a time now where I'll go to the back of the sanctuary, and and there may be some here uh, th- that are with us this morning that you've got some sort of a prayer need. You might even come to church this morning with that desire to have somebody pray with you and maybe somebody already has and and that's great but that's one of our major reasons for coming together you know we're not, we're not just doing church we're not just having church on Sunday mornings we want to be the church and one of the major things of us being the church is when we pray for one another and so if, if there, anybody here you have any kind of a prayer need there's something going on in your life that you would like a, a brother or a sister to come and and just help draw near and, and support you in uh, please, as we uh, go into our time of worship now, you could come to the uh, back of the auditorium or sanctuary or big room, whatever you prefer, uh, that you, you come back and, and uh, let us pray with you. You know, I used to say uh, uh, back of the room and somebody thought, because of the way I slur my words so often, they thought I was saying the ba- bathroom and asking why I was telling people to come to the bathroom uh, to, for prayer. Uh, but if you w- want to come to the back of the room for prayer, uh, we'd be glad to uh, have that time with you. Maybe the Lord has spoken directly to you through his word today, something in the text. Uh, that he's calling you to holiness. Holiness is more than just sexual purity, but in his context, that's a, definitely a major aspect of it. But it, maybe there's something that God is dealing with you directly this morning uh, with regards to his word. And no judging. Uh, there's not going to be any uh, aspersions or anything like that. We just want to help. We want to pray with you. And, and so let's go into a time of worship. Let's go before the Lord right now. Seek his face and uh, let him draw us into his presence. If you'd like to pray, uh, come to the back with me and one of us will uh, be glad to join with you. All right? God bless.